recall, what did we do last time? What did we do last time? So we define the space L1. If we have a measure space x with uh, some sigma algebra that I'm suppressing, usually m, and a measure mu, this is the set of all functions from x to, in general, the complex numbers, although maybe I'll restrict it to the, to the reals, for which the integral of the absolute value of f d mu is finite. And that would be a space of functions, but actually it's not a space of functions, it's a space of equivalence classes of functions, where two functions are the same if, they, if their distance in this norm is zero. In other words, which is equivalent, as we know, to having uh, being equal almost everywhere. And that's what this equivalence is. OK. Um, so this, so what we proved is that this is a metric space. Well, that's easy. That's almost immediate, induced from the norm, L1 norm. OK. And what we proved is the proved uh, the theorem of Reese and Fisher that as a metric space, this is complete. So Cauchy sequences in L1 functions converge to an L1 function. Okay, uh, we also. Um, just reminding you the, the key uh, theorems. We proved monotone convergence. Monotone convergence theorem. So if the end, Fn's are non-negative and they increase pointwise or almost everywhere to F, then the integrals increase. We proved Probini. Oh, that's me. Let's not do that. We proved Fubini, which is that the integral of the liminf of Fn's, again, Fn's are non negative, is at most the liminf of the integrals. Sorry, for two. That's what I'm getting next, what I'm getting to next. For two. Thank you. Getting ahead of myself. What we're doing today is Fubini. Thank you. Uh, for two and a reverse version. And a reverse for two, and reverse. But the reverse requires to be dominated. Reverse. If the Fn's are dominated by some g in L1, then it's true in reverse. So the lim sup of the integrals of the Fn's is dominated by the integral of the lim sup's. Okay, and we use that to prove the dominated convergence theorem. Dominated convergence theorem, which again, if the Fn's converge to F, now they're arbitrary. These were for non-negative uh, monotone convergence, and for two were for non-negative. Dominated convergence is, uh, these are arbitrary, let's say even complex value functions, and they converge to F. Again, pointwise, but there's no such thing as pointwise in L1, so this is almost everywhere. And if the absolute values of the Fn's are bounded by some auxiliary g that has nothing to do with uh, that convergence, except that it's in L1, then we know that the integrals, that it's better than that. We know that not only do the integrals of the Fn's converge to the integral of F, but the Fn's themselves converge in L1. I guess I put the one up here to F which implies, of course, that the integrals of the Fn's converge to the integral of F. OK? Uh, and a key um, aspect of this completeness proof was uh, the fact that if you have a sequence, Fn, which is an L1 sequence, and Fn converges in L1 to some function F, um, then uh, there exists a subsequence, subsequence f and k, uh, which converges to f almost everywhere. f and k converges to f almost everywhere. 
Okay? And we saw lots of counterexamples to all of these if you drop any condition. So, if, uh, if LY is complete, so there must exist an app that makes the FN converge. So. In L1? Yeah. If Being complete means the convergence happens in L1. Yeah, if, 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 if given any sequence of FN, we, we can't find the uh, app. That's right. So, completeness, right. Uh, any coach you see. Completeness, any Cauchy oh, yeah. sequence yeah. of these things. Yes. So here I'm saying, suppose I do converge in L1. Oh, yeah. Then it is not necessarily the case that I converge almost everywhere. And the counterexample to that is our sometimes called the typewriter <laughs> sequence, yeah. as it just keeps moving all over the place, giving you a little bit of uh, size each time, whose, whose integrals all go to zero in absolute value. But uh, point wise, they don't have any limits. Yes. Uh, for this one, it's just a general statement about convergence in L1. Is that right? Yes. That's right. That's right. We use the dominated convergence of this to cook up this subsequence. Just so the fact that so this is just about speeding up the the rate. Is it right that they are dominated by like two f? Eventually? Exactly, for example. I mean, they converge in, uh, in L1. So. Um, okay, anything else I want to say before we get to new stuff? That is the, all the old stuff. We remember all of the counterexamples to uh, the dominated convergence theorem. There's two ways for the mass to escape, at least. Uh, right. One is for the mass to shrink but blow up. And the other is for the mass to stay bounded but run off to infinity, so that it's not bounded by any one function. Those are kind of the two standard things you should keep in mind for why dominated fails if you don't have, why you need this auxiliary G, why this L1 convergence can fail. Can you say the second one again? So one is the indicator function of 1 to n plus 1, n to n plus 1. So that stays bounded, but it runs off to infinity. And so the limit point-wise is 0. And yet the integral doesn't converge, let alone the, inter the integral doesn't converge in L1. And that requires an infinite measure space. Right. There's, so the G that would dominate all of them is 1 on the entire positive reals, and that's not integral. Um, the other example is height n on 0 to 1 over n, which again converges to 0 almost everywhere, but the integrals are 1. Okay, so you can blow up in the vertical direction, you can blow up in the horizontal direction. You can, the mass can escape in one of those two directions. So the limiting function is zero, while none of the integrals are. Okay, good. All right, let's get to Fubini, which is not for two, but, the, but is the topic of today. Let me even start on a new page. So this is actually, you can see this? You can see this better? Yes. Okay. So let's start with Fubini. I do have to write a little bit bigger, but maybe that's actually a good thing. Fubini. So here's the situation. Let me start in the middle, since you don't like the top. Here's the situation. You have two measure spaces, x1 with its complete sigma algebra and measure. I want this to be complete. And you have another one, x2. Like All sets of measure zero are measurable and have measure zero. Okay? Yeah, there are too many words <laughs> meaning the same, there are too many uses of the same word for different <laughs> notions. Yes, this is no Cauchy sequence. There's no metric. Uh, it's an unfortunate, anyway. So, what we want, we want to create, want to understand. What is meant by mu1 cross mu2 on x1 cross x2? You would think you just do the natural thing and, and cross them, but actually you have to figure out what's going on. And it's not, I mean, it's kind of obvious what to do. But um, So, uh, and I'm, I'm also going to assume that these are sigma finite. And sigma finite, which will make 
most of this will go through anyway, but uh, let's just make our lives a little bit easier. Okay, so the, the kind of obvious and then it turns out wrong thing to do. So the obvious thing is if you have any set A cross B in M1 cross M2, you declare, so let's call this cross measure mu, so I don't have to write, write it every time. You declare set mu, which, uh, should I already call it mu zero? I'm kind of hinting at what we're about to do. Set mu zero of A cross B to be mu one of A times mu two of B. That's where we're, that's where we're headed. We have to prove that this will this definition extends to something that is a pre-measure on an algebra, and then we hit it with Car Car Theodore. So why is it wrong? Well, it's not wrong, but there's more to do. Oh, yeah. So so the cross of these two is not a uh, even an algebra, let alone a sigma algebra, and so we have to take the algebra generated by it, and then the sigma algebra generated by that algebra. But what happens when one set has like infinite measure and the other has measure zero? Great, great question. As always, zero times infinity is declared zero. <laughs> okay? So for example, I mean, just to drive this home, if I, if I have, uh, if x1 is r and x2 is r, then I want r cross, z, cross the empty set to have measure, I want a line in the plane to have measure zero. R cross the empty set. Or a point. The empty set also has measure zero. Yes, but R cross the empty set is the empty set? Oh, yeah, okay. R cross zero, you're right. Why is the product of M1 and M2 not unique in algebra? Well, we have to prove that it is. You said that it wasn't an algebra. So, we have. Um, it, it is an algebra, but we have to it's, prove it's an algebra. It's, so, not, it's not you can take our two rectangles that don't have... Yeah, we're, we're going to prove this right now. Let's, let's understand what this... Let's extend this to an algebra, okay? Um, so, so it's very easy. Uh, so let A be the set of all finite unions, finite unions of disjoint rectangles, disjoint rectangles, by rectangle, I mean I mean A is just any measurable set. It doesn't look anything like an interval. But A cross B is what we will call a rectangle. Uh, A cross B in M1 cross M2. And then, of course, the claim is that A so defined is an algebra. Okay, so what do we have to show? A is closed, so here's the kind of uh, schematic. Here's x1, here's x2. I have some set A in x1, I have some set B in x2, and here's A cross B. This is A cross B. Okay, so uh, finite unions of disjoint rectangles, that's the set A. Why is the complement of, let's start with just a rectangle, why is the complement of a rectangle a finite union of disjoint rectangles? So look at A cross B complement. I have to recognize it as a finite union of disjoint rectangles, but what is the complement? So I just extend these lines. I hope you can see this. So this part is, what's this part, for example? It's A complement cross B. Does everybody see that? So this is A complement cross B. Disjoint union, how about this part? A cross B complement. And how about these four corners? A complement cross B complement. So that is a finite union of rectangles and hence is in A. Okay, and how about a, um, 
How about a union of two such rectangles? So A cross B, let's say A1 cross B1, uh, union, union, is this how I want to say it? I want to make I want to make this a disjoint union, but it's a disjoint union in um, A2 cross B2. So again, let's draw our picture. Here's X1, here's X2. It's not that A1 and A2 are disjoint. So here's one rectangle, and here's um, another rectangle. So the A's, this is A1, and this, if you can see it, is A2. That is A2. The A's are not necessarily disjoint, but the rectangles, A1 cross B1 is disjoint from the rectangle A2 cross B2. Okay? So what if we have a union of two such things? So this, by definition, is closed under finite unions. There's nothing to prove about finite unions. We we're, we're, need to understand is it closed under complements. So what's the complement of this? Yeah, you just extend all the lines. I mean, this I should really leave as an exercise. It's, it's an, an easy exercise. You extend all the lines, and then everything decomposes into things like uh, A1 cross B complement, take away A complement cross B. Okay, so exercise, exercise, uh, write this out in the same way. And you'll see that you only need finitely many disjoint rectangles to capture this product of this disjoint union of two things, and then induct. Okay, so that's what I mean by it's not uh, immediately obvious. There's there's a little bit of, of something to do, but when you take the set of finite disjoint unions of these rectangles, that does form an algebra. Not the rectangles themselves. Okay. Could we have said take finite intersections of finite unions, and then had just did this complement step and not had to talk about. Um, it's equivalent because we'll pick, once we have complements and finite unions, we have finite intersections. Yeah. So finite intersections of finite unions. Yeah. Okay. Great. So it is indeed an algebra. And let's extend the definition. I'll slide this up so we know what A is. Extend mu zero to A uh, by mu zero of an element of A. So an element of A is some disjoint union, finite disjoint union. And I want the measure, pre-measure of this finite disjoint union to be just the sum of these products. This is why it's useful to have them all written as finite disjoint unions. If I'd said intersections, I don't know what I would have done. Right. This. It makes this a little more annoying. Yeah. So a generic element here is a finite union of rectangles. Disjoint union of rectangles. And by this I of course mean and this, we know what that means. That's mu one of AJ times mu two of AJ of BJ. And theorem, really a lemma. It really took us uh, six or seven weeks to figure out to use a marker. <laughs> okay, you learn, learn, you know. This is mathematics, right? Things that are <laughs> obvious in hindsight are sometimes. Um, yeah, maybe we'll figure out some reason this is no good. Okay, um, yeah, what's the obvious theorem? Lemma. We have constructed a pre measure. So remember what it means. What does it mean? Countable additivity on mu zero 
if it so happens that this countable union is a finite disjoint union of rectangles. So, so if it so happens, let's start with just one, and then we'll, we'll easily uh, come up with the general picture. If A cross B happens to be a countable disjoint union, okay, so the picture, here's X1, here's X2. So if I have some rectangle, A cross B, but I can break it up as a countable disjoint union. Okay, so some doesn't have to be like some nice decomposition, just countable disjoint union of rectangles. Is disjoint or like almost disjoint? So almost now we're gonna do disjoint. The only reason we did almost disjoint is because we're dealing with actual rectangles and we wanted to make them closed, and then there's some line along which they like it's all um, unnecessary stuff that we did because we were, wanted to do it in RD. But in general, let's just say, here, here we are, just, you know. Uh, these A's are coming from mu, are coming from the measures M1 and M2, the measure, measurable functions. And so they include, I can make this one open and that one closed and so on. So I'm not worried about, they're all, they all have to be closed. And, and so this, there's this line along which they meet. That, that was an artifact of, of our approach at the beginning. Okay? But even though they are almost disjoint, our case and the intersection of the, their boundaries matter. Is that right? That's the argument we had to follow in the real world, but uh, in the general world, we can just say, let's make them exactly disjoint and see what happens. I mean, that's the general definition of a premeasure. <clears throat> so, if one of these rectangles can be decomposed, the point is I can't measure mu zero on general sets yet. So I can only measure them on rectangles. If the rectangles can be decomposed into this uh, countable disjoint collection, what we want, what we want is that mu zero of this product, which we know what it's supposed to be, should be the sum, of course. We want countable additivity, not subadditivity, but additivity along these rectangles when the definition only applied to finite sums. Okay? All right. So, um, so a good way of doing this is the following. So given, basically we're gonna look, we're gonna use the fact that these are all uh, coming from measures, M mu one and mu two are indeed measures. So let's look uh, sector by sector. So given, Given x1 in, let's see, I think I can slide this up all the way up because now we know what to do. I guess that is one of the drawbacks is that I end up writing a little bit bigger so there's less room for everything to fit on the page. Okay. Given x1 in A, so here's A, so I fix some x1. Um, I want to look, consider, Consider x2 in B uh, such that um, x1, x2, x1, x2 are in A cross B. Okay? So I look at the set of x2s that are there. Well, all the x2s are there. All the x2s in B are there. But by the disjointedness of these things, for any x2, each such x2, and this is why I really want uh, disjoint and not almost, dis I don't want to deal with uh, technicalities, lies in um, exactly one of the bj's. Exactly one bj. Okay? Um, and so what does that mean? So for every x1, I get it for each, for each x1, I get a decomposition of B as a disjoint union of those BJs for which x1, x2 is in AJ, BJ. And x1 is fixed in this union? Yes, so I'm fixing each one. I'm fixing, I'm fixing each x1. And then only some of the BJs will arise. The ones that do will be disjoint, because along that, that sector they're disjoint. Some won't arise at all. But that gives me a disjoint 
decomposition of B. And I can do this for every single X1. Okay? Now, um, each of the BJs are measurable and B is measurable. These are all in, these are all elements of M2. And mu2 is a measure. So since mu2 is a measure, the measure of B, the measure with respect to mu2 of B, is exactly the sum over all of these uh, guys of measure with respect to mu2 of the BJs with the condition. So here's the, the condition. Let's, let's make, let's sum over all the entire collection. Um, but I only want to use the ones for which um, x1 is in the appropriate aj. So we have lots of different aj's corresponding to the, the bj's, whatever rectangles, whatever j is the rectangle. So whenever I need the jth rectangle, I need it because x1 is in aj. I'm taking a strip, yeah. So, the, so all I'm trying to justify is x is the indicator function of aj of x1. So this is a 0 or a 1, depending on if aj, bj contains x1, x2. Does that make sense? So every time I see, every time the jth rectangle is involved, it's involved because x1 is in aj at the same time as I'm measuring bj. So that's like the analog of this condition. Okay, and this is true, well, there's one more condition. This is true, this was all assuming x1 is in A. But of course, if x1 is not in A, then, then these are all zero anyway. So I can put here an indicator function of x1 being in A. Okay, if x1 is in A, then this is just the measure of B2 being this entire sum. If x1 isn't in A, then this side is zero and all of these are zero because all of the AJs have to add up to A. This is the key identity. Okay. Now, what can we do? Integrate. integrate. <laughs> Let's integrate both sides of this with respect to mu1 as a function of x. So if we integrate, now I, now I wish I had more room. It's okay, I'll rewrite it. If we integrate over x1, the characteristic function of a x1 times the measure of b, d mu1, uh-oh, of x1, might need another sharpie, is equal to, now, am I allowed to move the sum inside the integral? Why? They're non-negative, and we had this, we basically the monotone convergence theorem says if you have non-negative things, or a, constant, a corollary of the monotone convergence theorem was that if we have non-negative things that we're adding up, then we can interchange the integrals in the sum. So this is a sum, as j goes from 1 to infinity, of the, indi the integral of chi a j x1 times this constant for each one, which is mu2 of bj d mu1 of x1. Okay, so I integrated both sides, and then I and then I flipped. This is basically because of the monotone convergence theorem corollary. And now we're done, because what is this? Is it delta i j for a j and b j, right? Um, well, so this is a constant. Uh, this does not depend on x1 at all. So, so that constant pulls out. And this is mu1 of aj. And the product of the measures is nothing but mu0 of aj cross bj, by definition. And what do we get on this side? Uh, mu, mu2 of b is a constant. And the integral comes out to mu1 of a is equal to the sum over j, and these are mu zeros.
When did we use sigma five? Uh, we didn't yet. Okay. We're going to use that um, soon. Okay. So, so let me slide it back down and just remember what we proved. If it so happens, this, this A cross B, this one rectangle, is a disjoint union, countable union of rectangles, then we've proved it. We need to know that this is true along all finite unions of disjoint rectangles. But of course, mu zero, by definition, survives finite unions. So if it's true on one rectangle, then it's true in general. So true on A. True on A. The countable additivity of mu zero is true on A, which is now. Now we know what to do. What do we do? Do, yeah, do Kerr Theodori, right? So mu zero gets extended to a mu star on the power set of x1 cross x2. We have the set of Kerr Theodori measurable things. We can restrict to that. Um, mu zero, so mu is the, how shall I say this? Well, it's the sigma algebra generated by A, and some people, uh, prefer to stop there. Uh, if we're if we're really following the Carthodori construction, that'll actually be the closure of this. So di different books handle this differently. Um, some people would just say take the sigma algebra generated by A. In other words, restrict mu mu star even further to the sigma algebra generated by A. But that won't be complete. So for example, um, uh, note that. This by itself is not complete because uh, if I take um, if I take a non-measurable set in X one cross a set of measure zero, this will this is not there. This has measure zero but isn't there. Okay, this is uh, this has measure zero in uh, mu two. This is not measurable in, in M1. A set like this will not be measurable until I close it up. Yes? Is there a notation for the product of two sigma algebras that isn't? Because it's not just the set product, right? That's right. So effectively, we're taking the product of the two sigma algebras, yeah. taking the sigma algebra generated by the product of two sigma algebras, and then, and then closing that. And do we have a way to denote that? For, if we're M. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. There's not a standard notation for it that I'm aware of. So I just call it M. Question. So the mu star you're defining on the power set of the x1 cross x2, but then you're. So this is an abstract, abstract set x. On this abstract set x, we have an algebra and a pre-measure. The beauty of doing abstract, doing this abstractly is we don't have to do anything again. Right. So we just apply Carthia Dori. Are you restricting it to M? Exactly. So mu restricted, mu uh, star restricted to M is what we will call mu. And that's what we mean by the product measure mu1 cross mu2. I thought you were I'm just reminding you, there's a general theorem that from a pre-measure and algebra, you can generate a measure and you can complete that measure. So I'm reminding you of what we proved previously, but I didn't, yeah, we didn't need to say all of that. We could have just said, it generates a measure. Here's the measure, that's what we're gonna call mu one cross mu two. Okay, any questions on that process? So just to, so, this mu is what we mean by mu1 cross mu2. Okay. So when I write mu1 cross mu2, that doesn't mean I'm just only measuring rectangles. 
You take the rectangles, you extend it to finite unions of rectangles, that gives you a pre-measure, that you run the Kerr-Theodori Kerr program through, and that gives you the measure mu1 cross mu. Great. All right. So, um, working our way up to Fubini, what we want, what we want is to compare um, if I integrate something on x1 cross x2 with this measure, mu1 cross mu2, how does that compare to integrating something along x1, d mu1, and then, I guess I should have left more room, in some order, integrating piecewise. So obviously we need to understand what happens to slices, slices of the space, with respect to these numbers. Okay, so given We're working our, our way up to when can you reverse orders when you're integrating. Um, okay, so given E in M, M is this sigma algebra generated by the algebra generated by finite unions of rectangles. Um, let's look at, so here's a kind of funny standard definition, let E sub x1 be the set of all x2 in x big x2 so that x1 x2 is in e and e super x2 that's how you know which one you want is x1 in x1 so that x1 x2 is in e so again if this is x1 and x2 i have some set e doesn't look anything like a rectangle. For a given x1, this is the set that I will call E sub x1. And for a given x2, let's see, that is the set that I will call E sub x2. Again, there's no reason for these to be measurable. And in fact, in general, they won't be measurable. As we just said, because we completed it, we can have a measure zero set in x1 cross a non-measurable set in x2. That can't happen very often. Okay, so um, here's the proposition. These are lowercase x. Lower, lower, yeah. For a given element x2 and a given element x1. Is that better? So um, it certainly is not the case, as I just said, that in general, these will not be measurable. So in general, in general, e x2 need not be in mu1. It's some subset of x1. It doesn't have to be a measurable subset of x1. Okay? But if E is in A sigma delta. So let's recall what that is. So reminder, um, it's the delta of A sigma. Delta is countable intersections. Countable intersections in A sigma and A sigma is countable unions. Sigma means add, delta means intersect, countable unions in A. So if E is of this special form, then in fact, then for all x2, the set Ex2 is indeed mu1 measurable. Moreover, its measure, mu1, since it's measurable, I can measure it. So this is a function in x2. So this is a function of x2. That function is mu2 measurable. The function is 0, 1. It's a simple function. And the pre-image 
is takes only measurable values in M2. And moreover, this is this may be okay, so three things. One is this, two is this, and three. And um, if I integrate this function, uh, how do I want to say this? Yeah, let's just say it like that. If I integrate this function over x2, d mu2, I recover the measure of u. So if I want the measure of e, I can get it by chopping, if e is one of these nice sets and not some weird set, I can get it by chopping it into sectors and adding up the sectors. Can you say again what the a, a sigma data? Yes. So first, let's talk about a sigma. Oh, why can't you see that? Because this pen is starting to die. Countable unions in A. So we have our A, finite unions. There's so many uh, things going. A is the finite unions in the rectangles. A sigma is countable unions in A, which means countable unions in rectangles. A sigma delta is countable intersections in countable unions in rectangles. Countable intersections. I'm used to pens running out and being able to just throw them out. I don't suppose anyone carries around a Sharpie with them in A sigma. Okay, <laughs> like I said, all problems that seem solved get new uh, problems. More money, more problems. Okay, proposition, proof. Let's slide this up. So the first thing I have to argue is that when you take one of these slices, you get something that's measurable. First thing I have to argue that when you take one of these slices, you get something measurable. All right, let's let's work our way up to this set a sigma delta. Start with just e. So if e is a rectangle a cross b, then there's not much to show. E x two is either is either a or the empty set. So it's A if x2 is in B and, and the empty set otherwise, right? I mean, here's the picture, x1, x2. If I actually have a rectangle, <coughs> then depending on whether x2 lies in B or not, if x2 just misses it altogether, then I get the empty set. If it hits it, then I get all of A. And, and these things are M1 measurable. This function the measure, the mu1 measure of E x2 takes two values. It takes the value zero or measure of A, and it takes those values if, so, so in other words, this is the measure of A, that, that thing really worked, huh? Times the indicator function of B of x2. And that's that's a simple function. So this is obviously mu2 measurable. So far so good. And if I take this and if I take this function and I integrate it over x2 uh, this is mu1, of course, mu1 of a. Mu1 of a times the indicator function of x2, and I integrate with that with respect to mu2, I will obviously get mu1 of a as a constant coming out, and then mu2 of b, which is also mu of a, mu of b. So for rectangles, it's obvious. once you parse what all the words mean. OK. Um, let's look at a sigma. So 
So I guess we can still see here what the three things we're trying to prove are. Ex2 is measurable, the measure, that mu1 measure of Ex2 is mu2 measurable, and the integral recovers the full measure. So if E is in A sigma, what does it mean to be in A sigma? E is a countable union, not necessarily disjoint anymore, countable union of things in A, which are finite unions, so we may as well bulk those together and just look at countable unions of rectangles. Okay? So if we have countable unions of rectangles, now arbitrary countable unions of rectangles, as usual, so here's my E, it's a countable union of rectangles, but I can break that into countable unions of disjoint rectangles by doing it piece by piece. So can assume, can assume uh, that this union is actually a disjoint union. Yes, so you start with um, A, A1 cross B1, and then you break the union of A1 cross B1 into, so if I have one rectangle and if they intersect, then I break that into three rectangles. And then if I have more rectangles that intersect these, so any finite stage, you just break them up into more rectangles, a finite number of rectangles every time. So, count, so pass that to the count of the So now I just want to take all the disjoint components and assume that this is a disjoint union. Okay, um, once we have that, so for each x2, what is ex2? Again, I have a fixed x2. It's just like before. It's some number of, uh, it's some, See now it's now it's like bleeding or something. Can you still read it? It works. It looks yeah, good. It works. Okay. It works so well. All of a sudden it's bleeding. <laughs> well, then it got thin, and then it, and then it's yeah. It went too hard. Okay. Um, this is a disjoint union of E J X twos. Well, that's just that's just uh, obvious, right? Yeah, uh, EJ, uh, sorry, EJ is BJ. Um, each of these is EJ. Is it clear what I'm saying? And each of these was a rectangle, and we know that the, that what we just proved is that any time you take it, a slice through a rectangle, you get something measurable. So these are all in M1. And EX2 is a disjoint countable union, doesn't matter that it's disjoint anymore, of things in M1. So the whole thing is in M1. Okay. It's in M1, that means I can measure it. That means I can measure it. And the mu1 measure of EX2 since mu1 is a measure, it, it works well with countable disjoint unions. That's the sum of mu1 of the ej of x2. So what? Each of these is a mu1, each of these is a function of x2, which is x2 measurable, and we have an infinite sum of them, which is the limit, of course, as the limit, it's the limit as some capital N goes to infinity of the finite sums. The finite sums of mu1 measurable functions are mu1 measurable, sorry, mu2 measurable, these are functions in x2. So let me write this out. Let me write this out. It's a, it's not a tricky argument, but it's worth writing out. Um, so, each mu1 of ej x2, each ej is itself a rectangle, so this is mu2 measurable. So their partial sums are, so each sum as j goes from 1 to capital N is 
and the infinite sum is the limit. And uh, sum up to infinity is the limit as n goes to infinity. And limits of measurable functions are measurable. So is mu2 measurable? And that limit is this function, but this function is this function because mu1. So we're constantly playing the measurability and countable additivity and so on of mu1 and mu2 against each other. Okay? So this sum is true because mu1 is measurable. Each of these functions for each rectangle is measurable, and we have this increasing uh, countable sum of them, which is some limit, and limits of measurable functions are measurable, and each of these was mu2 measurable. So far, so good. You really have to build it up in this uh, in this way. What page is this? Five. Okay. So now we know that mu1 of this thing is mu measurable. There are three things we needed to show. One is that ex is in mu1, so we can measure it. That, as a function of x2, is mu2 measurable. And the third thing to show, so the third thing to show is what happens if we integrate over x2 of mu1 of ex2 d mu2. So it is a mu2 measurable function, so I can integrate it against mu2. Now each mu1 is equal to this sum. If only I had some theorem that lets me reverse sums and integrals. Monotone convergence, monotone convergence theorem, tells me this is equal to the sum, as j goes from 1 to infinity, of mu1, the, these integrals over x2, mu1 of ej x2, d mu2, And we already proved that for rectangles, this is equal to mu of ej. And the sum of mu's of the ej's, if the ej's are disjoint unions of a set E, since mu is a measure, this is equal to mu of E. And what we wanted to know is that when we do this integral, we get mu of E. Yes. Yes. So at the moment, what we've done is we've taken a countable collection of rectangles. So that'll be our big E. And then when we take an x2 slice through it, so we break them up into disjoint rectangles. And I slide it through, exactly. And then I slide for each x2, I slide through and over, over all of those sets. That is an x2 measurable set, a mu2 measurable set. When I add them all up, I, we, what we just proved is that you do recover E. So we can do it for the rectangles themselves. We can do it for disjoint unions of rectangles. We can do it for arbitrary unions of these rectangles, because we can do it for disjoint unions. And finally, we need to do it for intersections of disjoint unions. But that, that's kind of the easiest part. Um, OK, so let's do it. I might not get to everything. Let's go a little bit faster. So finally, if E is in A sigma, we already handled, now delta. So um, yeah, this one we're going to do in two steps, and this is where we're going to use sigma finiteness. Uh, and the measure of E is finite. So let's make that initial assumption. Then, so there exists some sequence ej, or some, some set in a sigma, and I can make them uh, zoom down onto ej is contained in ej plus 1, and so on, and the intersection over all the ejs is e. Okay, in other words, Here's my x1 cross x2. So I have E here in the middle. And E is the countable intersection of a bunch of A sigmas. That means I have sets in A sigma, which I may as well take to be nested, if they're not, just make them nested, that zero in on E. Question? How would you make them nested? Same process that we use to make them disjoint. 
if they're not disjoint. So if I have, I'll just show you the first step of it. So here's E, and I have E1 that contains it, and I have E2 that contains it. So first take all their unions, and then take their eventual unions. Their unions after removing E1, their union after removing E2, will be a, will recover E as a nested union of E. Does that make sense? So, okay, so let's argue that I can make them nested. Okay, why well, can I have a question? So you can like take this, the center of the two intersections, E1 and E2, and make a, a new, like A1, I'm sorry, a new like E1, and then an E2 is like the outside pieces, right? Sort of, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if F, J uh, ha are not nested, not necessarily nested, nested, and their intersection is E, then set E1 to be their union, countable union of countable unions, so this is in A sigma, and then E, J in general is the union over, uh, let's call this En in general, is a union over J at least N of, e of FJ. That's an En, En, yes. Okay, so I'm just saying, forget E1, you didn't need all of E1, because all of these guys didn't have intersection E anyway, and then zoom all the way down. Maybe I want to take this intersected with uh, E or something. Yes, E1 is as J goes from 1 to infinity. In other words, take the union over all of them. What we're worried about is that, they don't, that E2 isn't contained in E1. So let's say we had F1 that wasn't contained in F2. So take all of their union. I'm just making a limit of these sets. Right, but you're saying there exists That's what I'm. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. If there existed FJs whose intersection was E, but they weren't nested, here's how you make ones that are nested. They're obviously nested because they're all constructed. Each one is contained in all the previous ones. Why do you need E1 and E1? And the last thing to show is that the intersection of the ENs is still E. Yes, yes. The last thing to show is that the intersection of all the ENs is still E. And um, and that is so. And intersection of all the ENs. Anything that's in all of these sets is in all of the FJs. No, only it's an infinitely many FJs. It's not necessarily all of the FJs. Right. So did I not do this correctly? This is a simple. Okay. It's a simple process that you have to do a little bit more carefully than I've done. Um, What's the right argument? I guess I want, anyway, let, let's not do it right now. There's a, there's a simple process which is exactly the same as before that cuts uh, arbitrary unions into disjoint ones is also a process that will cut, I guess I didn't do it right here, but I think the, the principle is, is uh, well, so. Let's, let's take them to be nested. In general, they don't have to be, but you can make them by an easy process, and dot, 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 exercise. Okay, that's the easiest way to not, not spend time on something. Okay, so, um, so this isn't the right construction. Fix this. Okay, so let's say they're nested. So now we have these EJs, they're nested, they're zooming in on E, uh, and each of them is a and each of them is a countable union of, of things. That means E is in A sigma delta. Um, so let Fj of x2 be mu1 of Ej of x2. So I'm taking each of these slices. So here's some x2. I take some slice. And for each j, I see how much of that slice was inside Ej. That is a sequence, and what's happening to that sequence? 
Uh, and let's, and uh, right, the whole point is that's a decreasing sequence. So this decreases to the function f, which is mu1 of e x2. So this is, these are all known to be mu2 measurable. And so this is mu2 measurable because it's a limit of mu2 measurable, as before. Um, right. Uh, as before. Okay. I guess I could have first said, before I'm allowed to write mu1 of this, I, know, I need to know that this is measurable. But because E is the intersection of the EJs, the cross section is also the intersection of the cross sections. And so the E um, JX2's intersection is EX2. And why do they decrease to that? Oh, because the EJs decrease. The EJs are nested down. Okay, thank you. And, and I should have said, we assumed here that the measure of E is finite. That means the measure of all these slices has to be finite for all for almost every x. Okay? So I need to know that the in order to know that the measures decrease, I need to know that for almost every x. So this is true now for almost every x. Um, let me think about this, right? And um, f uh, for, for example f1 of x2 is already finite for mu2 almost every x2. Okay? So 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 the functions decrease. So for, for instance the functions uh, which are the characteristic functions on n comma infinity uh, are nested you know, the sets are nested and they decrease to zero but the measures maybe I'm confused the so measures I'm, don't decrease to zero. So I'm assuming that the measure of E itself. Yeah, the measure of the intersection of those sets is zero. Yeah, so um, what you're worried about, let, let me give you an example of I think what you're worried about. Let's say you take something like this, like one over x squared. So E is this region under one over x squared, which has finite measure, but this cross section for this value of x2, that's an infinite set. I think I'm just a little confused. Oh. Uh, so, it, so it may be the case, there may be some x2s for which this f1 has infinite measure. If that happens on a set of posit positive measure, then, then their total sum will be a set e, which, it, which then the measure that that happens with will be infinite. So I agree that the cross sections of e should have Finite measure almost everything. Yes. Uh, the cross sections of EJ, though, do they have to? Ah, um, I need to start with, thank you, I need to start with an E1 that also has finite measure. Thanks. And I can assume that the measure of E1 is also finite. Thanks. But if E1 is measured, then E must be measured. E, e must, you know, I mean, you could have taken E1 originally to be uh, whatever, be all of x1 cross x2. But I mean, right? that's you how E1 is, measures of E1 is not as infinity. Yes. It's, it's finite. Then mu E is, is not fine. It's, it's not, it's, it's well, finite. Well, no, so, so what I'm saying is the fact that mu has finite measure means there does exist some, some sequence that nests to it with the first, uh, the first set already having finite measure. So that's not true for a general. Uh, it's, it's not true that any uh, representation of E as a sig sigma delta starts with a, already a set that has finite measure. But I'm saying you can't always take one yeah. if mu has finite measure. OK. Now I understand. So, so we're assuming that mu of E1 is finite, and hence F1 is finite almost everywhere, and hence all the fj's are finite almost everywhere, and they decrease to a function which is finite almost everywhere, and is mu2 measurable. So as before, f is mu2 measurable. Okay? All right. Um,
And now we just use dominated convergence because all of them are dominated. All are dominated by F1. So I can use dominated convergence theorem to say that the integrals, that the integrals of the Fj's d mu 2 converge down to the integral of f. Why is f1 divisible? Because it's dominated by f1. So why is f1 integral? f1 is integral because the integral of f1, f1 is uh, this mu1 of e1 x2, and e1 is from a sigma. That's right. And so we showed that its integral is the measure of e1, and the measure of e1 is finite. Should I write all of that? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Okay. So, to see, to see that f1 is integrable with respect to mu2, uh, note that uh, f1 one of x2 is equal to mu1 of e1 x2 and e1 is in a sigma so the integral of f1 d mu2 is mu of e1 since we already proved it for sets in a sigma and that was assumed to be fine Good. Okay. Um, so, so, so now I can apply dominated convergence. Now, hopefully, you're happy with dominated convergence. And what are these integrals? So, each of these integrals is the measure of e j, and that converges down to this thing, which uh, mu the the measures of nested sets, if as long as the, the first one is finite, converge down to the measure of the set itself. And that's what we wanted to prove. Okay? So now we've proved the proposition for, we wanted to know that you can do this slicing and integrating for sets that are in A sigma delta. We did it for sets of finite measure that are A sigma delta sets. So how are we going to do general sets? <coughs> now we're going to use the sigma finiteness. Okay. So if um, e is in A sigma delta and is general, use that x1 is a, is a disjoint, is a countable union of fj's with mu1 of fj all being finite, and x2 is a union of gj's with mu2 of gj's being finite, which means x1 cross x2 uh, you can recover as a union of, um, I don't even want to say this. All I want to do is say, and I don't need this, this fact, because this, this fact we can argue about, but all I want to say is that mu1 of your E, how do I want to say this? Whatever your E set is, if you intersect it with F, j cross gj. That's bounded by, so this is not mu1, this is mu now. Mu of, of this thing is, um, oh, and these, these fj's and gj's are in, so fj cross gj is in a. a is the set of all rectangles. Can we make them increase as well? We could make them increase, yeah. Um, yeah, by taking partial, yeah. Um, Fj is contained in Fj plus 1, and Gj is contained in Gj plus 1. So the measure of E intersect, uh, so E intersect this set is just another, if E is in A sigma delta, then this is also an A sigma delta because it's just one more intersection with another uh, rectangle. So this is in A sigma delta, and this measure is finite. 
So the previous thing tells us that everything is true for these. And then we, and, uh, again, by monotone convergence, they increase to measure of E. So it can apply previous results plus monotone convergence. So one more time, since that was many pages ago, what is it that we've proved? Still writing? No, I want to take them, yeah, I don't want some arbitrary, I just want to take the j one and the j one, And that will increase to all of x. So in general, I could take fj cross gk. But once I've made them increasing, I may as well just take, I may as well just take the j one and the j one together. And just, yeah, yeah. So this increases to the measure of e and all the previous things that we proved. Are true. So in summary, let's just look at what we proved. If you have if you have a set which is a countable union of rectangles and then a countable intersection of those, then when you chop it up into pieces along each x2, if you chop it up, let's say horizontally, each of those will be mu1 measurable, so it makes sense to take their mu1 measure their mu1 measure is a function of x2 is mu2 measurable. And when you take the mu2 integral of that function of x2, you recover the measure of e. It's true for rectangles. Then it's true for countable unions of rectangles. Then it's true for countable intersections of countable unions of rectangles, as long as that entire union is finite. And then if it isn't finite, then we use the sigma finiteness of x1 and x2 to extend it to arbitrary sets of that. Can you keep doing that? Like then intersecting, then union. And it's as far as we need to go. But yes, if you, you know, so desired, uh, you can build up the complexity of, of these sets. It's as far as we need to go because now um, I need to prove one more proposition before I can get to Fabini Tinelli. Uh, let me try to do it quickly. So, so here's the final con consequence of that proposition: is that if E is now some arbitrary measurable set in the sigma algebra generated by uh, this uh, algebra A, then, um, so three things, this is one, E x2 is mu1 measurable for not every x, for mu2 almost every x2, Um, we're just extending all of the previous things to uh, mu2 almost every x2 instead of every x2. So once you've done A sigma delta, don't bother doing any more because now you'll do the general one with almost every instead of every. So the only difference, I'm going to write the same things. Uh, mu1 of E x2 is uh, mu is m2 measurable as a function of x2 measurable. Uh, for almost every x2, and and part three um, is that you recover the, now I don't need mu almost every because that washes out in the integral, the mu2 is measured. But in particular, like this didn't depend on which order you chose mu1 and mu2, right? So you exactly. Well, that's, that's, that's Fubini Tinelli. That's what we're going to do in the next negative two minutes. <laughs> okay, so we're almost there. What's the proof? The proof is that if you have one of these measurable sets that's constructed out of an algebra, uh, if you recall, so recall, recall that there exists an f in a sigma delta such that the measure of f take away e is zero. So you can, by, by the construction of exterior measure, what you did is take countable unions, and that countable union can be made less than epsilon. So it can be made like 1 over n, and then you take the intersection of all the things that differ by it by 1 over n, and you get something that differs by, the, by measure 0. 
Okay? So in other words, uh, IE um, F is equal to uh, E disjoint union, a set of measure zero. Okay? And now I want to prove all of this for um, sets of measure zero separately, and then F separately, and then we'll get the result for E itself. So we know it for F. We know for F. We know 1, 2, and 3 for F. That's what we just proved, the proposition, that it's true for A sigma delta sets. Need it for Z, and then all the measure, all of these things are just that the measures are differences. Um, uh, should I just make it an exercise, or is it kind of, kind of clear? Um, for Z, for Z, which has measure zero, this is Z, Z has measure zero, for Z, um, well, again, in general, there exists a, an A sigma delta set such that Z is contained in G and the measure of G is zero because it matches the measure of Z. Um, and Z x2 is contained in G x2 because Z is contained in G. And all of those things have, so so this has, um, but uh, the mu one measure of G two is zero, which implies Z two is measurable. Is mu one measurable? Um, Etc. I'm trying to rush, but I'm rushing too much. You see what you do. You see what to do, right? And the measure of um, E x2 is equal to the measure of F x2 minus the measure of Z x2, but this measure is equal to zero. So is it important at this step that mu1 is a complete measure? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We're using the completeness of, of mu1. Absolutely. Okay. And then, and then use uh, use the previous proposition on f. The point is, mu one of e x two is the same as mu one of f x two, and we know all the nice things that we wanted to know about mu one of f x two. <laughs> let me state it, and then I gotta let you go. I'll state Fubini Tonelli, and we'll prove it next time. So theorem. Bini Tanelli fundamental theorem. Um, okay, so let F be a function. I'll just write in L1 of x1 cross x2. So it's integrable with respect to the product measure mu1 cross mu2, which is what we've been talking about all, all day. Then, uh, for mu2, almost every x2, the slice f x2 of x1, which is just f of x1 and x2. So, I, so I'm just saying slice f along x2. So this is a function of x1, um, is integrable on x1 with respect to mu1, and measurable, of course. Two is that uh, the integral over x1 of f of x1, x2, e mu1 of x1 is mu2 integrable as a function on mu2. And part three is that if you do this integral over x2 of this function, x1, f of x1, x2, d mu1, and you take that integral with respect to d mu2, you'll get the same thing that you would have gotten if you had taken the original function f and integrated it with respect to d mu1 cross mu2.
That's Fubini Tinelli. The proof is, uh, again, just a couple of applications of what it means to be a function. You start with a characteristic function of a set. That's exactly what we proved previously. Characteristic functions of measurable sets, this is true. And then you build up from there to arbitrary sets by taking sums and then limits and, and so on. We'll do that. We'll do the proof next time. Uh, everything that you've seen already. Okay.